I have to tell y'all, so it's kind of funny. So I uh, got married when I was 40. So I was Mary Lowry for a long time. And then I became, my husband's in the military, so we tried to put all these names together. So I can tell when people meet me on how they address me, whether it's Mary Lowry, my supervisor still calls me Dr. Lowry, and everybody kind of morphs back and forth between Nordberg, Lowry, Lowry, Nordberg. Some of the medical students get confused and they call me Nordberg, Lowry, I really don't care. But, you know, it's just kind of funny. So we look at the time spectrum and people who just recently know me, they're like, why, did, why do they call you Dr. Lowry? I'm just like, long story. So, so I apologize, I was late today. My car uh, blew up yesterday and uh, I had rent a car, but the good thing is, is I got one of these new cars. My car is a 2004 Yukon XL. It has no little things on it. It's totally manual, and I'm in this Nissan Murano, and it's got Bluetooth, and their people are texting me in the car, and they're calling me. I'm like, this is really nice. I like this. I may have to consider that, but my kids suck all my money out of me, so I, I don't have any. So I am going to talk a little bit about PDL1 today. Now I will, and uh, Luke mentioned, so I'm a cytogeneticist and molecular geneticist. I run a full service genetics lab. We are an affiliate of y'all, so a lot of students come and do rotations with us. We have hired many former students from here. Um, we are, uh, Delta Pathology is a regional lab. Our primary headquarters is in Shreveport, Louisiana, but we have 50 pathologists all over the state. We go from the northwest corner of Louisiana all the way to New Orleans, and we have recently acquired uh, two hospital-based labs in Meridian, Mississippi, and Laurel, Mississippi. So I've kind of made the loop. And, and so we do, though, at Delta Pathology, we do all of the I don't want to call it ancillary, but I'll call it ancillary. We do all the, the extra pathology type testing. So all the PDL1 IHC comes to us, all the HER2 IHC comes to us, all the ERPR, all the big breast panels come to us in Shreveport. Um, our breast pathologist does a lot of that, including some of the PDL1 stuff I'll talk about today. Um, but in our lab, we do all the cytogenetics for everybody in our network, all the molecular genetics for everybody in our network, and all the fish for everybody in our network. So it's kind of a smattering of everything. Um, and again, we do, we're a clinical lab, we do translational research, uh, but for the most part, um, it's clinical. So if y'all have any questions, interrupt me, stop me. Um, I'm gonna start the story from today and then I'm going to go back and give you a little bit of the backstory um, because PDL1 is an extremely exciting thing. I have to talk about the little bit of other things that are related to PDL1 because they came first, like EGFR, Alk, and Ross. Won't spend a lot of time on that, but it's all related. So, um, in full disclosure, I will tell you if I'm supposed to do this. I am a consultant for Merck. So spent a lot of time with Keytruda, and we'll talk a little bit about that today. I'm also a consultant, for, and I'm an equal opportunity consultant. Bristol Myers Squibb, so nivolumab, which is um, actually my mechanic. I'm going to tell you another little story. So my car blew up yesterday. My mechanics administrative person, she's like, well, where are you going? I said, I'm going to go to Houston. My, I need to make sure my car's OK. She says, oh, we're going to Houston on Thursday. And I said, oh, maybe we should ride together. And she says, no, her husband has bladder cancer. He was supposed to die in three months. And they put him on nivol uh, nivolumab, and he's five years later, he's alive. And he comes down here every so often for a checkup. And he's doing absolutely great. And we'll talk a little bit about the immunotherapy, because that's kind of where PDL1 goes into. And remember, this is lab medicine. So we're pathology, and this is no offense to pathologists at all, but oncologists and treatment strategies drive lab testing. Okay, so that's kind of what happened to us. I got involved with oncologists who drove the pd one and really made Delta kind of come up to speed and start testing in-house. So I know I'm sitting in a center where immunotherapy, especially CAR-T and all that stuff is like, this is it, I mean. But it's a cool thing, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit of the story and how we got there, just so you'll understand everything. So there is lots of literature, and it's been done and redone about uh, immunohistochemistry testing. And I'm going to focus mainly on lung cancer, but all bets are off on everything. Like I just said, bladder's there, 
There are some Hodgkin's diseases there, everything. And pretty much opening now, and I'm not talking about microsatellite instability or uh, deficient micro MMR. Have you all talked about that at all in class ever? Well, you know microsatellite instability. I'm not talking about that, but it's changed the whole way we do lab medicine. So the pathologist in general in the clinical lab has had to come up to speed because all these anti or immunotherapy drugs, et cetera, have kind of come on and they can't do it without the test. So you have to do the test, just like chromosomes. You have to do cytogenetic analysis to see if there's chromosome abnormalities in a patient who has a hematologic disorder because, and it may be a normal histologic bone marrow, but if there's a 5Q minus or there's something else, somebody's got to think twice about doing that. So the lab has really kind of come full circle. There's a bunch of ways, and I just throw this up here, and this is out of the guidelines. There's lots of things that happen uh, with um, immune function and immune surveillance. And I cannot say enough good things about immunotherapy because I think that that's kind of the holy grail now of where we're going on treating a lot of cancer disorders. Because if you can make your own immune system or you can override the immune surveillance with, uh, particularly with the dysregulation with PDL1, et cetera, and some of the other T cell disorders, I think it's great and that's kind of a thing. So this is why we do PDL1, all this right here. So many drugs. Uh, again, uh, dramatic, dramatic, and I'm going to show you an example in a second of results with a lot of the patients. Not everything is equal, but pretty much uh, pembrolizumab and, and nivolumab, I can't even say, Obdivo, whatever, uh, they kind of came out about the same time. The other thing from a lab medicine perspective, like it or dislike it, are companion diagnostics. So companion diagnostics, you know, for those of us who have done molecular in the past, there was no kit, there was nothing. You made your own primers, you did them, and you know, I hate to say it out loud, but cross your fingers sometimes that everything would work appropriately. I mean, we have come full circle now. Now there's kits, there's all these regulations, there's all this QC. We can buy, like for BCR ABLE, we can buy 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3 controls. Never happened before. You had to make your own. The good thing is it makes lab medicine more reliable. Um, the bad thing is, is that sometimes you have these companion diagnostics, and if you don't have the platform, and I'll talk about Keytruda, and for the PDL1, sometimes you can't do the test. And so it, it's kind of. Um, it's good and it's bad, but these, this is why we do PDL one right here, because the clinicians want to treat the patient and they have to have the result for the most part, the, at least with Keytruda, I'll tell you, and the companion diagnostic in order to prescribe the drug. And so that's kind of the catch 22. You got to do the test, you got to do it. Okay. So this is the end of the story. And then I'm going to back up and tell you the beginning. So this is what our, and they, these are right off of our reports uh, and I've clipped and pasted and hopefully don't have any HIPAA stuff in here. This is what we pull off of our um, ASI instrument, our high path. And we read all of our immunohistochemistry on this. So whoever the pathologist is on the service, um, is in charge and they correlate it with the tumor percentage and then the number of cells counted. And so this was an example. So when we go back to this slide here, so you see that with Keytruda, for example, or pembrolizumab, you have to have, there's a value associated with that. You have to have greater than or equal to 50% staining in order to benefit from the drug. Th that's changed a little bit lately. And they've shown now that even any cell staining, any tumor cell staining will respond to the drug. But in the beginning, it was greater than or equal to 50%. So as you know, for those of you that have done immunohistochemistry, when you look at, when you look at this, uh, this is pretty easy. I mean, you see it's a high level of expression. It's kind of like fish. I mean, you can read red and green dots, assuming you're not colorblind, and it's pretty straightforward. The same thing here with expression. Just like HER2, though, there was some pathologist subjectivity in how it was going to be read or not. Digital pathology has taken a lot of that away. So now we have a 
objective system that basically goes through and does, you know, class zero, class one, class two, class three, and does the expression. So in this case, it was greater than or equal to 50%, and it was scored accordingly and then reviewed by pathology. And this was a metastatic lung. And the cases I'm going to show you are pretty much lung because that's the most, the bulk of the stuff that we do. Um, I have a whole stack of papers. I put them in my bag, but we, we do lots of pdl one every day. Every lung cancer case, squamous, non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer, others, and, and I apologize, my, yes? I'm sorry, is there ever a transformed type of lung cancer that doesn't respond to pdl one Yes. What do you do in that instance? There's lots of things. We can talk about that in a minute. At the end, if I have time, there's a whole bunch of other oncogenic drivers that we don't know about. So um, did anybody, anybody listen to an AMP webinar yesterday on myelodysplasia? Anybody in this room? Um, um, it was great. But it has to do with uh, uh, Association for Molecular Pathology. But he talked all about myelodysplasia. And if you're a member, you should join. If you're not, you should join. Because there's a lot of genetic stuff, side genetic stuff. He talked about 5Q minus in myelodysplasia, but guess what a lot of the 5Q minus patients have that we've never looked at before, P53 mutations. So we didn't even know they were there, I mean, because we're not looking for them. So now he's saying, he was saying yesterday, for every 5Q minus case you have, you should reflex and do P53. The other one's SF3, uh, B3. The other one for others, so, and we won't go, I'm not talking about that today, but yes, there's a lot of other oncogenic drivers. If they don't respond, then you have to, you have to switch. But remember, and I'm gonna go, let's, I'll back up and let me go through this and then we'll talk about that later. Because there's other things you do before PD-L1. But pd one is, in my opinion, is, is, the treatment has pretty much revolutionized a lot of the way we treat lung cancer. Lung cancer is a bad disease. But if you have lung cancer and you got PD-L1 and these immunotherapy drugs, you know, you, you have a good chance of surviving, just like I was saying the woman with bladder cancer husband. Okay, this is an example of a negative case. So our reports are pink and yellow. The yellow are tumor or, or solid or tissue, and these are FNAs. But you can see here there's no expression. So I think everybody in this room can see it's a lot of brown staining, immunohistochemistry. The instrument picks it up, it's, it's overexpressed, and then this has none. So by definition, this patient would not be a candidate for some of the immunotherapy drugs because there's no expression. So it's kind of like some of the other molecular markers we see. Why treat if you're not going to respond? So we try to do personalized medicine. We're not quite there yet, but we're getting closer. We're getting closer. And, and in a community practice, not at MD Anderson, where everybody gets personalized medicine, but in a community practice in Shreveport, Louisiana and beyond, I mean, this is what we're doing. This is personalized medicine for each person. So let me kind of back up a little bit. So the story was is that oncologists come out, they want to use all these drugs. Okay, so they're like, okay, Delta Pathology, you are the holders of our tissue. You have our lung biopsies. You have our FNAs. You know, somebody needs to start doing PDL1. So, but there are other markers that came before PDL1. PDL1 is the newcomer, but he is the strongest guy on the block so much. So, y'all know what biomarkers are, right? Y'all talk about them. Okay, so I won't spend a lot of time, but. We do, there are predictive biomarkers, there's diagnostic biomarkers, there's predictive biomarkers, and there's gonna be a little quiz in here I'm gonna give y'all. So, you know, we all know, you know, chromosomes show one thing, fish shows another thing, DNA mutations show another thing. Sometimes they all flow together and everybody's good and happy. Sometimes one is positive, the other's negative. So it's like Orlando was saying before, you kind of have to take it all together. Sometimes the bone marrow is normal, but all these molecular things are abnormal. And now the clinician's mad at you because you found all this stuff, but you, you know, something is wrong. You know, the, the best example of that is, um, and I don't know if you talked about Eurovision, but urine, non-invasive, you just urinate in a cup and then you do fish for Eurovision. Have you all learned about Eurovision? Okay, it's not normal to have polysomy in your urine cells, 
okay? If you got all this junk going on in there, something is happening somewhere. It's not normal, and especially if it's persistent. Maybe it could happen once, maybe it goes away, but if it's there persistently, somebody needs to get up and look around a little bit in my bladder or in my renal pelvis and see what's happening because something is kicking out cells that are abnormal. So the urologist will tell you, oh, there's nothing wrong, I didn't see anything. There's something going on. So what happens first, chicken or egg, whether the genetic abnormalities happen and then it transforms, or does it transform and then the genetic abnormalities happen? It's kind of like B. cerebral. Does B. cerebral happen first? Does 922 happen? Does B. cerebral, what ha we, I don't know exactly, but it's all related. So kind of in the scope of your training, so these are all examples of how you work up, particularly lung cancer cases. So we know from a pathologist's perspective, if you get a biopsy and you're trying to decide, hey, does this guy have lung cancer? There are diagnostic tools. There are immunostains, which can also be run on a di by digital pathology. Not so much quantitative, it's just are they there or not. Like TTF1 is one that we use a lot in lung cancer. Prognostic for KRAS, so KRAS in lung, KRAS in colon is therapeutically driven, but KRAS in lung is more prognostic. A lot of times I'll just give you a little caveat, insurance doesn't like to pay for KRAS in lung because it's really just extra information. But in general, KRAS, if it's there, is a poor prognostic parameter. And then predictive, so we all know the EGFR, ALK, ROS, MET, RET story, and pd one So all these, and what, what I've had to kind of train my clinicians to do, my treating clinicians, is they have to say they want to order these tests because they're trying to make therapeutic decisions. Not just because they want them, but they're making therapeutic decisions. So I have to show little figures about how this all works because I think they're cool. And the medical students grown because they think that they're over it after first year, but it always comes back. And now they're fourth years in their residence and they're looking at it again and they're like, oh my gosh. So EGFR was the big one. So EGFR and lung cancer kind of came first. And we know now that EGFR is a potential target. And there's a lot of tyrosine kinase inhibitors that target the EGFR mutation. You can have a good EGFR mutation, you can bad. These are all molecular. You can do EGFR staining by IHC. You can do EGFR amplification by FISH, but typically the way we do it for lung cancer, at least, is it's all um, mutation based. And so, but, and I'll come back to this in a second, the percentage of patients that have EGFR mutations in lung cancer is probably only about 10%. Okay, so if you took everybody who had lung cancer, about 10% of the patients would have an EGFR mutation, which is just the opposite pretty much for PDL1. A lot more patients have PDL1 overexpression than they do EGFR. So if you're a clinician and you're trying to figure out how to treat your patient, you get more bang for your buck if you do PDL1 than EGFR, but that's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to do all these first, and then if they fail or they progress, then you go back and do PDL1. But because the drug is so successful, PDL1 has become the number one choice in many of the algorithms for most of the clinicians. They want before you cut, so when they go in, y'all know how they do the lung biopsies? How, they, how do you get a lung? How do you get tissue out of your lungs? You spit in a cup? No, not unless you're hacking up something. No. Yeah. So the the radiology guys go in there, which is good. I mean, they used or they can cut your chest open and do a lobectomy, which is what they used to do. But now radiology's gotten pretty cool, and they go in from the back, they go in from the side, they go down your throat, whatever and they get a little piece of tissue out. But you know what's wrong is that little piece of tissue is teeny tiny. So they want all these molecular markers on this. So what's happening is you're cutting through the block. And by the time you get around to doing pd one there's nothing left. So now a lot of the clinicians are saying, we want pd one first, and then we're gonna just start treatment with an immunotherapy drug, and then we'll do the EGFR and we'll do the ALK and the ROS. Anyway, so this is kind of an example, and so we're going to focus on this bottom one, and I have another slide in a second. Not going to talk about CTLA, we're not going to talk about that, but this is another cool pathway. Again, these all have to do all the immunotherapy. So remember, you have more T cells than B cells, right? 
right? Yes? Okay, you do. Unless you have lymphoma, and then sometimes you have more B cells, T cells. But the T cells, their job is to really do cell mediated immunity. So, what, what has happened with all this immunotherapy is tumor cells are really smart. And y'all should know, I mean, they can evade everything. They kind of go through this whole little, you know, stealth thing. They can, they can look like one thing. They can live without oxygen. They can live without blood flow. They can sneak out of the breast, for example, and get into the circulation. And they all do it by evading some of the known pathways for shutdown. So what's happened with the immunotherapy is we're using the therapy, and I have another example in a second. Does this have a little thingy on it? I don't know. Oh, there. So we're, we're doing this to where this won't bind to that, the ligand won't bind to that, and therefore the T cell beca can become activated, kill the tumor cell, and it all goes away. So it's, it's really novel, and it's a great concept. And um, there was a guy from here at AMP a couple years ago that actually talked about the CTLA. That's a whole other process. But all these are immunotherapies. And so I think this is going to become the norm, is using your own body's immune system to fight off tumor cells. So we talked about this before. By, they can be diagnostic. They can be prognostic. They can be predictive. They can determine therapy. And so these are what we talked about. So EGFR mutations. Now this is where y'all for the companion diagnostics. So PDL1, IHC, 22C3, PharmDX, made by DACO, has to be run on a DACO platform. It's called the companion diagnostic because the drug is given in conjunction with this. ALK also has companion diagnostic. Abbott makes this, Ventana makes this, and you get the drug, Zalcori, if you're positive for any of those. The same with EGFR. There's many tyrosine kinase inhibitors and depending on the EGFR mutation test. So from a lab medicine perspective, you can't just say, oh, let me just cook up a PD-L1 antibody and use it. Let me use it and we're going to try it. It doesn't work that way anymore. It used to in the past, but you have to use the PharmDX kit in order to have the drug paid for for your patient. Does that make sense? Okay. Good news and bad news about laboratory developed tests. As I mentioned, used to be we would set up a test, you would order primers from a catalog, you would set up your own test, you would do it. Commercially available kits now are in use. Many, many, which is a new phenomenon, are FDA approved, which is good for the lab reimbursement as well as patient insurance. So they are all regulated by CMS and CLIA, and you have to do all the things you do for lab stuff. So as Orlando mentioned before about validation, about competency, about putting stuff in use, it's, it's all regulated now. So what kind of happens, and this has to do with how the PDL1 works and how the digital imaging happens, is that you know it all starts with really the clinician. So somebody comes in and they they have a reason. You you don't just say wake up one day and say oh I think I have lung cancer so let's do PDL1. And it's not like hereditary cancer like BRCA1 or BRCA2 where you spit in a cup and it's in every cell of your body. You're looking at the tumor itself in, in, your, in your body. So you've got to get a tissue biopsy. So it either starts with the pulmonologist or the radiologist. Somebody's got to get the tissue out of the body. So it starts there, then the pathologist will look at it and say, yep, I think that's cancer. Yep, let's go, let's, let's start going. And then, just like breast, is the same way. You go in on mammogram, you have a, uh, an abnormality, they'll go in, they're like, well, I think it looks abnormal, it's not a cyst, we're going to go in and we're going to poke it and we're going to get a piece of tissue out and we're going to look and the pathologist says, yep, it's cancer. So then all the estrogen and progesterone, HER2 and all that starts after that. So at this point, every institution is different. So for breast, for example, and when we do HER2 and everything by IHC, we have something called a breast panel, and most institutions do. So once you know it's cancer, then everything, the dominoes start falling. So we do the HER2, we do the HER2 fish, we do the estrogen and progesterone. Lung doesn't quite happen that way in a lot of institutions. It has to be a, a clinician order. So the clinician has to say, okay, Mr. Jones has lung cancer. 
I'm thinking about using either a tyrosine kinase inhibitor for EGFR or I want to use immunotherapy or something, I have to do these biomarkers to point me in the right direction. So they do the biomarkers and then if, if it's insufficient tissue, which happens not infrequently, especially in these little small biopsies, they may go back and do another biopsy, which is invasive and kind of bad. Kind of what's coming down the pike, and I'm not going to talk about it today, are liquid biopsies. So taking circulating tumor cells from peripheral blood and looking for the same biomarkers in peripheral blood. So it kind of goes in conjunction. This is still standard of care with the tissue. You get the results, and then you decide to treat, not treat, whatever. So that's how most places and standard of care for doing, at least for lung, uh, it involves really multidisciplinary. That's what tumor boards are for. That's what cancer committees are for. You go and you talk about it, and then the, the correct, depending on, for example, the PDL1 percentage of staining, then the treatment is decided. Okay, so this is part of a quiz. So, which of the below biomarkers is not a predictive marker? So y'all know what ROS1 is, right? ROS1 and out, y'all heard about, okay. So that's, that's, so what is the, what is the uh, not a predictive marker and is more of a diagnostic marker? So I mentioned before in the beginning, so the pathologists use, so, so this is also what's changing, I'll tell you a little bit. So we used to have a long panel of immunohistochemistry markers to diagnose. Because the pathologist is cutting through the tumor so much and not leaving any tissue left for the molecular markers, some of that has been pared way down. So TTF1 is a lung marker for the most part, so that is more of a diagnostic marker than a predictive marker. PDL1, ALK, ROS, therapeutic markers, and can be predictive if needed. Okay. So, PDL1 as a biomarker. So, again, assessing PDL1 expression in most tissues, and now it has expanded. So, the, the, drug, the drug usage has gone beyond lung. So now we do it sometimes in breast cancer, we do it sometimes in head and neck cancer, but again, PDL1, immunohistochemistry. Uh, we do have a fish probe just for interest. Um, Y'all have all done HER2, right? HER2 fish? Yes? So you know the difference between HER2 immunohistochemistry and HER2 fish amplification? Have y'all all looked at that? No? Yes? No? It's not 100, it's not always equal. So there is a fish probe that we actually validated. We don't use it, it was a research project that you can look for PDL1 amplification in conjunction with immunohistochemistry. But nobody, nobody bites on that yet. So that was just, that was just a, fun, a fun thing we did. Actually, Peter Hartmayer got me involved in that one, just saying, just saying, figure that. <laughs> <laughs> figure that one out. So the reason we do this though is not just because we could. There was a huge trial, it was called the Keynote Trial, where they did look at cut point. So this 50% greater than staining by IHC was all done based on clinical trials and patients. So this was all established in a clinical trial, it was done, it was written up, and that was the clinical validation group that set the guidelines for how PDL1 testing is done. So if you look, and this is really kind of what happened with oncologists and why the treatment became a big deal, because if you look, if you look at patients who had greater than 50% and you look at the prevalence of patients who had greater than 50%, these numbers are actually a lot higher than what we see with EGFR and ALK and ROS. So again, they've shown that these are good biomarkers to follow in these patients, and they also responded a lot better. So if you look, 10% of patients with lung have EGFR. EGFR mutations are more common in Asian, the Asian population, in females, and never smokers, which doesn't always correlate with, at least in Louisiana, with our patient population in Louisiana. And then ALK is even less than that, and ROS is about less than that. So again, if you're an oncologist and you're trying to come up with a treatment strategy, the likelihood of finding someone who's PD-L1 overexpressed is greatly increased over EGFR and ALK and ROS. 
but again, you're still supposed to do, according to the guidelines, you're supposed to do EGFR, ALK, and ROS first. But then the other little kicker is turnaround time. So for those of you that have or have not ever done IHC, it's pretty easy. I mean, you can flip it in less than 24 hours or about 24 hours. EGFR takes anywhere from seven to 10 days. ALK and ROS, a little bit less, it's fish. It's still longer than doing IHC. So here the oncologist is, you know, tapping his foot. It's been two weeks since the patient was diagnosed with lung cancer. He wants to start doing something for the patient. PDL1 is winning that race in a lot. And even if they start them on PDL1, anti PDL1 immunotherapy, and then they wind up having an EGFR mutation, then they'll take them off the anti PDL1 and they'll put them on a tyrosine kinase. Does that make sense to y'all? So it's really, a, it's a game and the lab has to play the game because even though you're holding the patient's tissue, somebody's trying to make treatment decisions on your patient. It's the same with chromosomes. I mean, why take a month to get your chromosomes out? I mean, the patient needs to be treated. So five days is probably long enough because the patient's had a bone marrow, he goes home, he rests, and by the time he comes back for his physician visit, so you can say, well, Mr. Jones, you have blah, blah, blah on your karyotype, and then you got pd one and we're going to figure all this out, you need to do it in a timely fashion. And that original book on the guidelines say you're supposed to get all this done within five to seven days. But you know, then you got to, some of these are archival, you got to get the block. So there's a lot of logistics involved. But I only tell you that because there is a time factor involved. And pd one wins most of the time because it's a fast turnaround time. Okay. And I'm not going to ask you this because we didn't spend it. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about how the companion diagnostic works and, and sort of its general lab policy. But um, you look at staining, and, and I know a lot of you don't do IHC, but you basically go, it goes from zero to 100%, and you're looking at tumor cells, okay? So you have to, the pathologist, what they do on the high path is they identify and it will go back to those original things. I'll show you in a second some more. They go, go to the side, they pick out an area of tumor. That area of tumor is scored based on the staining characteristics. All digital, okay, except for you are visually, the pathologist is visually picking out tumor on the side. So it, it's not completely random. I mean, you have input and output that you, that you go through. And then it's repeatable and reproducible, just like other lab tests. This is what the companion diagnostic part is. So about a year ago, we switched over to all these DACO immunostainers. We were using Ventana. And I don't know if that means anything to y'all or not, but we switched to DACO. And part of the switch was we got this little extra piece of equipment, the Autolink. Auto stain or link 48. And this, this does fish too, just so you know. It does some fish probes. They're not, uh, DACO also uh, acquired Agilent, and so a lot of the Agilent probes uh, you can run on here, with some of them. Um, but this is the piece that you have to have in order to do the FDA companion diagnostic. So a lot of labs were slow to bring it on because they didn't have this piece. Now, there are other, in, other antibody clones that I showed you in the beginning that you don't have to use this, but the original study with the immunotherapy and pembrolizumab had to do with using this for the IHC. It controls everything. Again, it's FDA, everything is, is QC'd, everything is qualified. So again, you're not just putting, and the antibodies are the same all the way through. So again, the process is you go in either with a needle biopsy, you get the piece of tissue out. Um, our pd one is all done on paraffin embedded tissue. So there are some places that, that have done it on other like FNAs or touch preps or some things like that. But the original protocol was validated for formalin, um, embedded uh, formula fix paraffin embedded tissue uh, from the biopsy. We do, do them on cell blocks also. So if they do a fine needle aspirate, you can take the, the tissue in the, in the fluid, spin it down, embed it in a block, and you can do pd one on that too. And we, we do that a lot because again, as I mentioned before, some, some of these tissues are extremely small. 
And so you have to be able to do the clinical testing on small pieces of tissue. And again, that's why also pathology has backed off on doing multiple, multiple immunostains because by the time you cut through, cut through, cut through, there's nothing left. And the oncologist, to be honest, I mean, they really want to know how to treat the patient. So if it's a diagnostic dilemma from pathology, that's one thing. But, and y'all know this probably here, but, you know, we used to worry about primary tumors, where the tumor was, what kind of tumor it is. Now we're moving more toward what are the molecular markers. So it doesn't matter where it came from. I mean, it does in general, but the molecular markers are the driving factor in a lot of the oncology. So this is our process. We get the slides. Um, this, we have, we, did, we went back and looked at several years. We've gone back 10 years and looked at pdl one staining as part of our validation, and it, it's all fine. So there was a theory that, you know, well, if, if your blocks aren't stored appropriately or whatever, you may lose some protein staining. The DNA is pretty good, but the protein may or may not be affected by storage conditions. So in the beginning, they said five years or less. We've gone back 10 years, and it works just fine. Okay, so kind of what happens is, is, is the tissue acceptable? Is there a tumor in the tissue? PDL1 is scored, and then uh, the tumor proportion score. So on our reports, and at the end I'll show you, so on our reports it's called TPS. Now there's a whole new strategy with gastrointestinal and GI biopsies. I'm not going to talk about that today. Same stain, same thing, it's just scored a little differently, which is where the digital pathology comes in. Because the digital pathology is a, is a objective way to score things, you can get a more consistent read on that. So you come up with a tumor proportion score. You're supposed to have at least 100 viable tumor cells in a tissue. If you don't, you have to put a disclaimer in there. And then um, we don't call them invalid. We just call them few cells, you know, or, or QNS if there's nothing. Sometimes there's nothing. So the, the way the, the instrument reads them is a percentage of cells with any membrane staining partial or complete. Uh, cytoplasmic staining is excluded for the most part. So these are some close-ups kind of, of what, it, what it looks like when you're doing it. So the original protocol had to do with identifying tumor cells, okay? There are other protocols for pd one that quantitate immune cells. A little bit more difficult, you have to have a little more experienced reader to do that, pathologist. But in general, we pick tumor, tumor in the tissue, and then the amount of expression is read off of that. So this, this would be the area um, that would be scored on the tumor cells. These would not be scored. Sometimes you'll see reports, they'll mention them, they'll talk about them, but the original protocol was tumor cells only. So this is an example of where the, the, there's positive staining, you see in the membrane staining, in about 60% of the case, so, so this is over 50. So remember the cutoff for pembrolizumab, for example, is greater than or equal to 50. So this would be 60%, the oncologist is happy, the patient can be treated, and, and we move on. Okay, so true or false? Can you do PDL1 expression in archival specimens? Paraffin embedded tissue. Yes, yes, that's all. I mean, that's rarely do you do it on fresh tissue. So the day of the biopsy, you don't get fresh tissue. Chromosomes you do, fish you do, this you do not they'll go embed it and then you can do it on archival tissue. So here's an example of negative. So this would be read as negative in a case. You, there's no brown staining. Everybody see that? Everybody knows. So there's no staining here. So it's pretty unequivocally negative. Um, the tumor is there. So these are negative cases. Um, no staining whatsoever. So like the first case I showed you, this would be reported out as negative less than 1% pd one positive cells, i.e. negative. Now here's where the instrumentation and the digital pathology comes in because different people may read these a little bit differently, but the scoring on the instrument, again, is pretty standardized. So this is an example of low expression. So this would probably be below, this is below the 50%. So we put them in, and again, at the end, I'll show you the reports again. We put them again as low, 
moderate, less, less than 50%. And here's an example of high staining. So I think everybody can see is clearly high staining, high expression, intensity is high, the staining is high, so this would be greater than 50%. So this would be a patient who is clearly eligible for the immunotherapy drug. Does anybody have any questions so far? Very good. Yes. They're just different antibodies. They're they're different and they're they're different vendors. So one's Bristol Myers Squibb, one's Keytruda. They both target PDL1. So the difference is they were the clinical trials were done under different situations. So nivolumab, you don't need to score. I mean, you can treat without ever doing PDL1. Although I just and again I have I talk for everybody, so it doesn't matter. I mean, I can wear one hat. It makes sense to me, though, just biologically, just like her too. The more staining you have, the more staining you have, it would seem to me that the more um, uh, benefit you would get from using a drug. But I think the reason that it isn't that way is because there's a whole there's some stuff we don't know going on in the background with immunotherapy. So they're just, they're both PDL1. So there's PDL2, there's an L2 also. But most of the drugs target PDL1 or PD1. So L is a ligand, PD1 is a, so they are, they're just different drugs. They were manufactured by different pharmaceutical companies. And then as I showed you in that very first slide, Novartis has one, there's, there's ton, I mean, it was like, oh my gosh, we better get on the bandwagon with this because this is, this is a big, big thing. The target is the same. Side effects are the same. Response rate is a little bit different, and, and we, I won't go through that a lot, but there are some different responses. And what they were originally tar so uh, nivolumab was done, was bladder, and then until Keytruda finished the clinical trials, they were primary lung, so you did Keytruda for lung, that was bladder. Now melanoma was in there, but now it's kind of an open thing. So if you look and you, I mean, if you Google all this or go to Medline or whatever, I mean, you'll see that everybody has pretty much come on board with some immunotherapy drug. But it's, they all target the same receptor. And it's really to, to, to keep those T cells activated and, and get the tumor cells to quit from binding with the, the ligand from binding with PD-1 that shut it down. So you want those T cells to stay happy and like growing and doing their thing. So this is kind of the spectrum that you see. So a lot of patients are here, a lot of patients are here, some are in between, but again, the numerical quantitation, which kind of goes back to your question, was originally designed for Keytruda because you had to have greater than 50% in non-small cell lung cancer to get the drug. But now it's kind of a second line, whether it's second line, third line, whatever, you can have any staining or you can have no staining and they just hope to goodness it works. But for, and I don't know if y'all, there's a commercial with a woman that has lung cancer, it's black and white ad and she gets Keytruda. But for patients who have failed, so if you do, so clinically I'll just tell you, if you do EGFR and say there's an EGFR mutation and you treat that patient with a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, they will fail probably, may fail, not always, but they may fail. And then, so then this is what you get next because now there's another thing that you can treat them with and the survival is impressive. So it, it really has done a lot for patients with not just lung cancer, but melanoma is another one that they use that, that has been very successful. Okay, so the same lab testing is the same. The other advantage for pd one and this is kind of why the oncologists like it, is you really just need one slide. So, so say you want to cut all these tissues and you want to save some tissue for EGFR, or ALK, and ROS. Well, I only need one slide for PDL1. So the oncologist is like, take the one slide, let's use the one slide, and then you can dig through the block and figure out the rest. Because all I need is one slide. So what we do is we load it on. Usually we'll take a couple slides. But again, you want to you wanna preserve what's in that block because really what's needed for treatment are the molecular biomarkers. So this is actually erroneous, I think, because the turnaround time really can be 24 hours if, if needed. 
ours is probably a couple days, but if they need it, they can get it because the IHC is run every day. Okay, so the, I show the slide because this has expanded dramatically. This was the original slide, and you see all the big boys are here, our buddies up here. So um, they didn't put us there. They didn't put y'all there. I mean, I don't know why. You know, I complained about this, and I show it because everybody, every lab, it's kind of what happened with KRAS and colon. Once, it, once they found out that you're not going to respond to cetuximab, if you have a KRAS mutation and you have colon cancer, every lab in the world started doing KRAS mutation because that's what the oncologist wanted. And again, it's treatment drive driven. So not that pathologists don't come up with testing on their own because they do, but a lot of this is supply and demand because we're not going to set up a test so I'll give you an example, and maybe you can complain. So if you're HPV positive, what happens if you're HPV positive? Do y'all know? Oh, and what was HPV cause? Charcoal cancer. Okay. So if you're HPV positive, and you go in in your pap, but you don't have cervical cancer, so there's a, a fish probe with, uh, have you ever used it from Neodiagnostics, the DTEX? Okay, so there's a fish probe that looks for amplification of TERC, T-E-R-C. It's a gene on chromosome three. If you, and we did this whole big validation. If you have TERC amplification and you're HPV high risk positive, the likelihood of you progressing to cervical cancer is pretty, is strong, okay? If you're HPV positive and you're TERC negative, then that timeline is a lot longer. So if I'm HPV positive, high risk, and I'm TERC positive, I want my GYN looking a lot more closely to see if I have cervical cancer. Well, the thing is, we did this whole test validation. Nobody ordered it. Nobody wants it. They don't know. I mean, we, I did all this physician education. Uh, nobody orders it. So Delta, you know, we're a private lab. And they're like, well, we're not going to do this anymore. Nobody's ordering it because, you know, but it, it makes sense scientifically. And, you know, you look at the data. But it's supply and demand. So it'll happen. But one, and then one day we'll be doing Turk amplification out the roof on every HPV positive patient. Because what happens is everybody gets on board. So the oncologist or the GYN or whoever. I mean, everything is genetic. Everything is genetic, whether it's somatic cell or germline, whatever. I mean, there's some genetic component to everything. Some things we know, some things we don't. So what happens, the way it happens clinically, is that you know most patients now the way it works now if you're diagnosed we do pdl1 up front um, if they've been patients they've been diagnosed for a while we do a look back and we test prior to initiation of treatment okay so if you're looking for pdl1 in tissue what kind of cells do you look at do you look at lymphocytes no, you look at tumor cells only. I mean, that's really kind of what it's supposed to be. Again, some of the other ones, like nivolumab and others, they'll look at immune cells. But in general, you look for tumor cells. You're looking for PDL1 expression in the tumor cells. And that's really which one. Okay, so here's a woman, and she is 65 years old, and she's got a long smoking history. And so she presents with a one month history of a cough. Um, she has unexplained weight loss and rib pain. So you're like, oh my gosh, you know, I mean, I, I, this would be like, you know, this is like textbook presentations. So they do a CT, she has a six centimeter mass in her right upper lobe and has lymphadenopathy. So they do a PET, she has two lesions in her liver, a CT guided core biopsies performed. So they did the diagnostic markers on the tissue, P63, TTF1, and they were uh, negative. P63 was positive, TTF1 was negative. She was graded as a stage one. So a couple things, remember, she's a 65-year-old female with a 20-pack year smoking history. So does she or does she not fit what I told you about those patients with EGFR mutations? She does not because she's not Asian, she is a lifetime smoker, and, but she's a female. So, but, but typically, that, that's not what she has. But if you look at this, this is diagnostic workup on a patient, on this patient. For everybody who presents this way, we do EGFR, we do ALK, we do ROS, sometimes we do MET, we do RET, depending on the clinician again, because now there's RET inhibitors, there's MET inhibitors. You know, FISH is pretty easy from a, 
in reimbursement status, I mean, the fish usually gets reimbursed. The EGFR sometimes doesn't. And I, I'm going to tell you all a little thing is that you can have the best insurance in the world. Best. I mean, whatever. Blue Cross Blue Shield Louisiana. That's what a lot of people think. Oh, I have Blue Cross Blue Shield Louisiana. But if you look way down on the end of your policy, which made me go back and look at my own, genetic testing is excluded in this policy. And that particular patient's policy and not all policies are the same. So just because you have insurance does not mean that you're going to get covered for a lot of the stuff we do. And that's just a little dirty little secret that we have come up on over the past couple years that, and they're denying a lot of the genetic testing for patients, which is unfortunate because then the oncologist calls and yells at me because it's like my fault that she didn't get tested. And what, happened at, what happens at Delta uh, as a non-academic lab, um, which I'm, I'm not sure I completely agree with, but if the patient is not pre-authorized and uh, we don't work out a payment plan or something, we, we're, we can't test. We, we don't test. So I was just about to ask that question because we run into that exact same thing. So now these pre-offs are... It's horrible. It, it basically keeps us from running EGFR. It does. And the turn, now the turnaround time, the clock is ticking. And you're waiting, like Humana, for example, I'll tell you, it takes 14 days for them to turn around a, a, a pre-authorization. So now the oncologist calls, they all have my cell phone and they yell at me like, again, like it's my fault. Like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm stuck it in the drawer and I'm not running it just to get at you. It's not that case, but the thing is, is that the lab is left holding the buck because I can tell you the oncologists aren't going to treat the patient unless they get some kind of thing. And, and I, I yell at my billing person in turn, they yell at me, I, is, I said, how can we do this to these people? How can we not test them? The other one, which is not for this talk, but it is for those of y'all that wind up doing products of conception or, you know, pregnancy loss, new rule is you have to have two or more spontaneous abortions. You can't before they'll pay for chromosome analysis without doing some big appeal. So, okay, fine, but sometimes, you know, it happens and you have a genetic etiology, but that's, but lab medicine is stuck paying for all this stuff. And to be honest, as a private lab, I mean, you, you lose a lot of money. So not that we're all in here to make money, we're really here to make, do patient care, but it is, it is part of a business. I mean, when you go work in a lab, it's part of a business. Training, you get to do a lot of fun stuff. You know, research, you get to do a lot of fun stuff, but when it comes to the bottom line, you know, a lot of these, these tests are viewed as not medically necessary. That's why it's important for the clinicians to get in there on their note and say, I am thinking about using immunotherapy for this patient. I need to know what the PDL1 status and the ALK status and the EGFR status of this patient so I can pick this drug or this drug or this drug. And then insurance is like, oh, okay, well, this just isn't a, you know, want to find out thing. I mean, it really is. Okay, so true or false, testing for pd one can only be performed on tissue from core needle biopsy. No, you can do it on FNAs, you can do it on whatever, so. Okay, so just to kind of um, finish up on some of these. So we talked a little bit about cutoff values. This goes back. You know, the difference of ALK, ROS, and EGFR compared to PD-L1. PD-L1 is very easy. It's a stand, again, it's a standard antibody. All, every baby pathologist in the world knows how to score immunohistochemistry. The, the difference now is that with the values and the quantitative values, the digital pathology has really helped to standardize that, not just for PD-L1, but for all quantitative immuno. Uh, histochemistry. And this also goes back to your question. So here's the big treatment. You know, what are you going to do? Here are all the little drugs. These are all different clones. I'm only talking today about 22C3 and the companion diagnostic, but I think y'all at Applied, you were using SP142 maybe? Uh, well, you were, when we were there, y'all were starting to look at another one on Ventana. So it depends though, but, but this is the other thing. So if you want to give the patient Keytruda, 
you better have done a companion diagnostic for pd one 22C3 and not done it over here because insurance is going to come back and say, well, wait, where's the 22C3? You didn't do the companion diagnostic. And again, most of the patients, the way it's supposed to work is you start here. If these are negative, then you go to here, but it's really happening in tandem for, for most of the cases. And again, this is the, the assessment for um, tumor proportion score greater than 50, less than 50, and then if you're doing immune cells, et cetera. And then I won't talk about the pathology. This is just the standard, though, that I want to show you all for, you know, here, this is what happens. This is what happens with the block. So you get this little bitty piece of tissue, and you're like, blah, blah, blah. You're cutting through it every time, little four micron sections every time. And eventually, you know, you may cut through, and you get down to here, and there's nothing left. That's why, from a lab perspective, I'll tell you, you look at an H&E here, and you look at an H&E here. And if there's nothing here, you can't assume that there's tumor here. I mean, you might have exhausted the block before you get to the end of the tumor. And then there's the bigger picture of all the drugs. And lastly, I'll just show you. So here's another couple examples. So we did this very long verbose thing I showed you before. They go through the entire in, uh, package insert, really, of, of what it all says. But you know, we let everybody know up front what no expression means, what low expression means, and what high expression means. High is greater than 50, low is anything over one. So again, you still get drug if you're one, but to me intuitively, I want to be up here. I want to be over 50% if you're giving me, because I want more receptors there. I want to suck up that drug as much as I can. No expression, less than one or anything. And then again, um, it's all scored uh, based on the 22C3. So here, this is a, a bronchial alveolar lavage, uh, left upper lobe. No staining here at all, y'all can see. And then uh, this is another one that is, again, high. So here's the image high, and then we do the number of cells counted, class one, class two, class three, and how they're all divided up, and then, of course, all the, all the references that are in there. And I think, and this is the last, now here's another. So we look, do the H&E and the tumor. So again, and that's all pathologist driven. So in summary, I'll just tell you that for 22C3, for PD-L1, um, we do, uh, you only sometimes need one slide. You just got to make sure there's tumor on the slide. And since, since it is a, vi you know, it's not like molecular where you're putting it all on a tube and running it. I mean, you are, it's a visual thing, so you are looking at it. Um, pathologist needs to judge the acceptability, like there has to be tumor. If there's no tumor, do it, you either need to get another specimen or do it on another block. Uh, turnaround time is that's a little high, and then testing for PDL1 is really um, about patient management, and so it's a predictive marker, a therapeutic marker, and the the one we use and the one I'll you know is the, again the 22C3, which is the companion diagnostic for pembrolizumab, and that's all I have. Anybody have any questions? Answers? I want to show y'all one thing, and I won't talk anymore. I promise. But if you look, I want you to look, this is where it's coming. And y'all know, y'all are sitting in, you know, a hotbed of everything cancer. It's like here, it's all, this is, this is like, you know, nirvana for cancer, if you, if you have it. Look at everything else, unknown, 41%, 41%. We don't even know what's driving. We don't know what's driving lung cancer. And there's all these new markers that you can look at. I mean, I mentioned P53 and myelodysplasia. That's kind of a new one. There's a new drug that for myeloma that we do P53 in and CLL all the time. We do P53 now for, well, it's in our CLL panel, but now if, if we don't do anything else, they want P53 because of the, the drug they use. CDK N2A, that's a big one. We do a lot of that in melanoma, but all these are big players in um, oncology. And uh, I mean, I was impressed when I saw this because I'm going the wrong, wrong way, yeah. Is the, is the one about the unknown. I mean, 41%, we don't know what's driving half of it. And we'll know, I mean, eventually, we'll know. But a lot of standard of care, we don't do, we do the EGFR, we do BRAF. Uh, we are doing HER2 now in some of the lungs because therapy, 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 therapy. But these are 
considered at least by insurance as investigational use only right now. They won't, they won't pay for this. But that's why the recommendation is get off of doing single analytes and do these big next generation sequencing panels. Because the other thing I didn't talk about, which do some other, is tumor mutational burden. It's not what you got, it's how many you got. And the more mutations you have, the better your tumor is likely to respond to some of these drugs. Not PD-01, that's, that's different, but all these. Like if I had every one of those, that means my tumor is like a little hotbed. It's something's going on. So the drug comes in and it's very genomically unstable. So it's more likely to be killed off than if I just have one strong mutation hanging out there. So that's kind of what's coming. I, I think that we're going to get away from doing, I think, PD-01 is great because it's an immunostain, you can do it, but I think we're going to get away from doing single analyte testing, at least for lung cancer, and move all toward next generation sequencing. But again, they don't pay for a lot of that. That's one of those unlisted codes that the insurance companies just love. Unlisted. No, we're not going to pay for it. So anyway, does anybody have any questions? Yes. So for the flow, uh, so once you get the uh, immunostain uh, slide, you said one of the pathologies select and carry mm -hmm. before sending to for digital. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess the, the pathology selects the most representative area, but is that a, a guideline? Well, no, that's just how we do it, and they do it there. So if you look at these reports. So somebody is assigned as the high path pathologist, okay? So whoever, like on this case, this is Dr. Abria, one of our pathologists, it's, it's her. She goes and she, she interacts and she does it there. That's how we work it through there. So they run that, they review it, everything is done, and it's very pathologist heavy. I mean, it, it, the tech sometimes will run it, but the pathologist always comes back behind to review it and select and make sure they're, but same with her too. They do the same thing with her too. So it relies a lot on the pathologist because sometimes with pd one in melanoma that we see every day, you may have a focus of positive cells, but 90% of the tumor looks negative. That's true. So if you select that specific area and send it for digital, you're gonna get like 80%. In fact, it's not Try. Like that. And the second question I had, um, in melanoma also we have some cases in which you have histocytes of, of macrophages that kind of look a lot alike to more cells, mm -hmm. and it's very hard for us visually to tell them apart. How is digital? I mean, do you know how good is it in terms of, you know, discriminating tumor cells versus inflammatory cells? You, you mentioned nuclear, nuclear sites, but sometimes well, it is, it is, and, and melanoma, so we do not use it for melanoma right now. We do for pd one but it's mainly lung. I can tell you what we do for the melanoma ones that are, that are questionable. You know, we do a melanoma fish panel, and that's even harder in the dark, but what's easy to tell if they're genetically abnormal. You know, it's like, you know, if I CDK, CDK into a deletions, or RRB1 is a great one, because RRB1 will be all over the place, even in cells that you don't think are, that don't look like tumor cells or that are questionable. Like, we, I had a case last week, actually, from our, one of our new partners in Meridian, Mississippi, and uh, they had, it was a shaving, and there was some technical thing about the shaving, and they were calling it a, a blue nevus, or some, but, but the cells looked a little weird, same kind of thing. But they sent it for the fish panel and it was all normal. So they backed off on you know, whether it was melanoma or not. So I think it, I think it depends on the experience of the pathologist. And you know, you know, you have to train, okay, there's a training part too on the digital. So you do have to train you know, on what, you know, what it looks for. And so uh, I think that it all kind of goes together. So you kind of play with the software yeah. to adjust the settings? Yeah, and we you trained them a lot on that, didn't you? Yeah, we do. Um, there are a lot of factors, not to no this for too long, but there are a lot of factors digitally that go into this. The algorithm that we use, it's a combination. So it's going to look at nuclear morphometrics, but it also looks at membrane and some of the cytoplasmic interaction. Part of it that's really important is the delineation of the area you're going to do the actual reading from. It must be done by somebody that's familiar enough with that tumor expression know that you're in an area of tumor and mm -hmm. not a stromal area or even an area that's a, a heterogeneic area that doesn't matter. So once you can narrow down that, the software will employ, like, again, membrane antagonists, membrane intensities, 
nuclear morphometrics, and then also the cytoplasmic overall scoring and density for that particular case. And that's how it generates uh, the predicated value of the 3, 2, 1 type of range. And as Luke is saying, too, is you have within the software the ability to circle areas or freehand draw areas of interest or eliminate areas of interest. So those areas that you feel should not be part of that score, you're able to eliminate that out. So you do still have that visual judgment of saying where is the tumor and where it's not because we don't want to have just a score of the whole area. Mm -hmm. and you'll see that with PBL. They'll actually be staining or looks like staining in, in areas that are, that are just outside. You have that able to isolate the area of interest and have it scored just in that area. Like that first example you said, I may mm -hmm. have a large area. If I circle just the area that I think is positive, my score is going to be really high. Well, you have that ability to be the judge of how much of that area needs to be there. Now, speaking of digital though, you always have a QC to go back. Why did I score it this way or how mm -hmm. did I get that score? You go directly to that image and see how it was scored. Whereas on the slide, now you've got to hunt that slide down. You may not even look at the same frames that you did when you did the initial score. This gives you that, that awareness to go back to exactly how did I score this and why did I score it. And that is a, that's a huge issue, not just for IHC, but for fish too. I mean, you know, the images are there. You can override them, you can go back, you can reanalyze them, you can rerun it through digitally. So there's a lot of, even though it's, quote, automated, you know, there's a lot of input that the technologists and the pathologists have to do to get to get to that point. So it's not just like, it's not like a CB, that's, and that's what frustrates me a lot. It's not like a CBC. You don't just run it in, spit it out, and go home. I mean, like, if you have discrepancies with the cytogenetics or the pd one or the tumor percentage or, or something, you know, there's always the ability to go back and, and, and do it. We do, uh, so we have digital uh, carry typing stuff, and, and we... <laughs> Unfortunately, for my IT people, we save everything. We save every image we have uh, that's captured on the scanner. And, you know, it saved us sometimes we go back and look and like, you know, where did this come from or this was something else and the same with fish. So I think IHC is no different. Well, you, still, you still have to have a technologist or pathologist with you. Yep. We're not just saying here it is, let's go. You still need to review and you have the final sign off on how you want the results to actually come out of it. And that's why we have, you know, some money rotates. It's a rotation every week. Like Dr. Abrio is here, Dr. Wellman is here. Everybody has everybody. Not all the pathologists participate, but all the ones that are participating in the high path and the digital imaging have been trained and are competent to do that. And it rotates through. But we do have technologists that load it and get it going and stuff. So, anyway, it's fun. So yes. So. I can see an issue arising where now that you're saving all these slides, but now you're also saving all these images on top of that, uh, doesn't that get a bit troublesome, burdensome sometimes? So I went to Delta Pathology in 2011, okay, and we spun up this lab, like, at mock speed. I mean, we in six months, we were doing full service cytogenetics, fish, molecular, I mean, it was crazy. And IT, I said, I would like to have my own server. Oh, no, 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 we can't do that. You need to use our server, our central server with Delta. I mean, we plugged that thing up like in a month. And they're like, what? So, they, and even now, even now, they still, because we take a ton of images, carry type of stuff. So yeah, it is an issue. So yes, so the storage is an issue. You still gotta save your slides, it's just the way it is. And fish slides you can throw away at your director's discretion. You can keep them and throw them after a while. Um, I like to hang on to mine, but we, we're in a smaller space now, so I've had to let go of some of the stuff. Um, and, uh, but the digital images are forever. So again, our carry types, our fish, our IHCs, everything. And the breast panels are the other one because we do a lot more breast than we do lung. So, uh, we, I mean, it is, it is cumbersome. And, but that's a whole, and my IT doesn't like the cloud. They think, I don't know, whatever. I mean, they think it's, you know, I mean, I understand. I understand all that. But it, it, you have to provide storage space for all that stuff, both physically and digitally. We use a, we use a cloud base, actually. ASI helped us build it. It's a completely secure uh, rack space. Um, but, but you have to have a, almost like a mega server if you're going to be doing Fish. Imagine you're taking, you're going from selecting two representative cells 
from every case that you look at to now 300, where are you going to put that? So you're either archiving it and downloading it to an external hard drive that can get damaged by weather or whatever. So the lab that I came to when I first got there, uh, when they would archive them, I would say, well, you know, where is it backed up? And they said, oh, we just have an external, and the CEO takes it home. So he has a garage full of external hard drive. It's just like in a flammable safe in his garage. Flameproof go. safe in his garage. And all this kind of stuff. So if his car blows up on the interstate, sorry. You know. So we're like, no, no, we have a virtual server, and I mean, it's a, it's a mega server, so it's only four servers put together. You do. You're going from slide now to digital, or going to data. And that's that's the future with everything. If you if you look at the history of X-rays, X-rays went from everything on a sheet, and everything's digital. So everything's going that way. And, this is just and look at carry types. We used to like do them manually in the dark room. Exactly. So do you ever see a future where we no longer need to keep the slides? Everything's backed up by a computer system. Yeah. Once, yeah. And that's kind of I, I think that's where everything's going to, especially with the digital imaging of the whole slide. Because if I'm doing a digital image of the whole slide, why is there a need for a slide? Just well, go in and, pull that open. and I agree. So we do um, a micro RNA for thyroids, and I don't do it. We send it. Rosetta does it uh, for us right now, and they okay. So we take a stained slide from cytology that has known questionable tumor on it, or uh, unknown, or yeah, suspicious, or whatever it is. Anyway, they take the slide and they scrape all those cells off. And then they do microRNA off the tissue. But it came up because they're like, well, if somebody sues us, we don't have anything left. They do full slide digital imaging. So if I have to go to court over Miss Smith's thyroid, I have a digital scan of her entire slide, not just little areas, but her entire slide is scanned so that we can reproduce it in a court of law. Hope that doesn't happen. But that environment exists in other countries. It's legal in places like Canada, uh, some places in Europe, Japan, recently. So they will use an all-digital environment and not store a glass slide, where they just redundantly back up a digital file. On this. But you run out of space. We run out of space, and I imagine y'all run out of space here. I mean, there are so. I mean, look at all the side genetic slides. I, I'm not even talking about the fish, but the side genetic slides. You got all these stain ones, and then. I mean, it really is, it becomes cumbersome. And then you got to find a place, and then they don't want to pay for you to get a big cabinet. They want you to use a little cheapo cabinet. I mean, that's my other thing. I mean, like, what, just give me a big cabinet. Why do I have to have six of the little ones? And then you, then you have to move them somewhere, and all of a sudden something breaks. And you end up with all the slides broken, and then where do you go? We try to send ours to Iron Mountain where we were last. Oh, yeah. Iron Mountain gets expensive. Then if you have to get a slide or a block back, you know, it's a nightmare. Good luck with that. Yeah. So I've, I bought a, a flammable um, cabinet for our blocks now. Oh, good. But, not but not yeah, yeah, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Not, we, I know what he's talking about. <laughs> 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 After X number of months, you're making it there, just make it. <laughs> <laughs> you want to get rid of it. Yeah, but, but again, those blocks, those blocks take up more space than slides to me. Exactly. You know? Yeah, because they're so, but it's still regulatory. I mean, like, like Luke was saying, in, in this country right now, it's still mandatory that we, we keep physical evidence of stuff. So, well, thank you all for your attention, especially after lunch. I appreciate that. Thank you.